if you've been following along on my channel, you know I'm in the middle of rebuilding this Series 1 uh, Bridgeport milling machine. In my last video, I got the quill housing all together and managed to solve a couple of problems along the way. So now I'm going to start assembling the top end of the milling head. And to be honest, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit during this reassembly. I'm not doing this in any particular logical order. I'm just kind of putting together what seems to make sense at the moment. So at the moment, um, I'm starting with putting this variable speed dial assembly back together. This uh, worm here that sits on the shaft and on the other end is the, the hand crank. This, uh, this gear engages with the worm on the hand crank shaft. And that gear is pinned to the speed change drum with the roll pin. I, I left it in the gear when I disassembled it. The original bearing block was made of plastic, um, but it was recommended that uh, if you have a plastic one to go ahead and replace it with one of these here that are made out of uh, brass. It was it was pretty cheap, so I, I did. And this pin here is what keeps the speed change drum from uh, turning too much, either clockwise or counterclockwise. I just want to be careful that I don't tighten it too much and prevent the drum from even turning at all. And then pinned to the drum is this chain. When you turn the hand crank on the speed change dial, it essentially wraps or unwraps this chain on this drum, which is why it was important to properly place that pin through the front of this uh, dial assembly. The other end of the chain is pinned to the this uh, speed change lever. Uh, this lever uh, essentially pulls up on one half of the variable speed pulleys. Uh, it is what um, ultimately allows you to change the RPM of the spindle on the fly. And then the other side of the speed change lever is pinned to the inside of the um, belt housing. And I'm going to loosely attach the faceplate to the belt housing uh, for now, um, just so these pieces stay together. And now you can see a little bit how that, uh, how this variable speed dial works. By turning the shaft, it causes that chain to wrap around that drum. Lastly, for now, I'm installing the crank handle and the uh, dial faceplate. I, I ended up replacing the dial faceplate. They, the previous one was, was fairly well beat up. I set that uh, top piece aside to get it out of my way. So now I can move on to putting together the gear housing. These springs um, are part of the high gear, low gear mechanism. There's a big um, washer that you can't see because my fingers are holding it that go um, between those springs and this bull gear. There's a couple of tabs on the gear housing that the bull gear needs to slip past. It's a, it's a relatively tight fit, so I'm just using the punch to rotate the bull gear around until it falls in there and it can freely move up and down. Next, I'm reinstalling the bull gear pinion assembly. This is something I also did not take apart. I just cleaned it really well. 
doing a little bit of pre-assembly on the bull gear shaft pinion and the high-low shift handle. Um, this handle, as you may recall, was missing on my machine when I got it. There's a pinion on the end of the shaft that meshes with a rack on the bull gear assembly. So I've only got this handle on this, this thing in a it temporarily. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to adjust it uh, so that it pulls the bull gear down completely uh, when it's in uh, low gear. So the recommended way to install this is to push down on the bull gear until it engages with the gear on the pinion counter shaft. Then slide the um, speed chain shaft in to where the end of it meshes with the rack on the bull gear with it in the low speed range. And so what I need to do here is to check it each time I insert this to make sure that the bull gear is in full mesh with that pinion gear on the counter shaft. And if it's not, I need to take it out, adjust the position of the crank handle, and then reinsert it and check it again. I think the trickiest part here is trying to visualize in my head which way do I want to adjust this crank handle? Do I want to go a little to the left or a little bit to the right? And then try it again. Of course, I was wrong the first three times. And with the handle and low gear here, you can see the bull gear and that pinion gear are meshing uh, really nicely. One of the repairs I knew I was going to have to make was this threaded hole in the sliding housing for the spindle pulley bearing uh, was completely trashed. So rather than spending $55 to replace it, I figured I would just go ahead and fix the threads. These uh, easy lock inserts are essentially just like a helicoil. The first thing you want to do is uh, drill out the hole and then tap it for an oversized thread. The kit comes with this insertion tool that has a hex driver on the end of it. And the inserts are coated with some kind of uh, thread locking compound. And that's a nice, easy, simple fix. This is one of a couple of different bearings I did decide to replace. Um, they were fairly inexpensive. But when I disassembled this, um, this housing and the brake assembly, you could certainly feel some crunch in the bearings themselves. And my little Arbor Press uh, doesn't have any problems with pushing these in. And then that uh, bearing and housing are pressed onto one side of these um, variable disc pulleys. And uh, now I need to press in the companion bearing into this uh, brake bearing cap. This brake bearing cap is new. When I inspected the original one, there were hairline cracks right through the spaces where those um, threaded holes are. <laughs> And then this uh, assembly is pressed on to the other uh, variable speed pulley. Uh -huh. 
and then after setting that spacer I can insert and press in the spindle pulley hub. I need to uh, make sure I line up that key there with the keyway in the uh, variable disk pulley. And to make sure the spindle pulley hub can't come loose, uh, there's a snap ring that goes on now. I like to try to clear out the grooves that they fit in before I try inserting them. And before I start installing some of this on top of the quill housing and spindle, I'm just going to take a file and quickly uh, make sure there are no remaining burrs at the top of the spindle. And with those uh, burrs cleaned up, I can slide the first part of the um, lower gear housing on top of the quill housing. For now, I'm just putting these nuts on snug. I'm not tightening them down completely just yet. This uh, lower gear housing uh, is lubricated with uh, grease, a lot of it. So about a tube and a half of this grease that I uh, purchased from H&W Machine will get... Um, spooned into and around and below the bull gear as well as the bull gear pinion and the counter shaft. And then there's this uh, wavy washer that goes into the bull gear pinion uh, bearing cap first before placing it on uh, top of uh, that bearing. And then all that grease gets protected uh, with this dust cover. Moving on, I can start assembly of the brake mechanism. First is this snap ring that goes on the end of the brake finger pivot stud. The uh, brake fingers go on next. And then this can be inserted into the housing um, and secured with a set screw. The uh, brake lock shaft is inserted into a sleeve and then uh, when you partially install it there's a cam that sits on the end of the shaft. The sleeve is secured to the housing with a set screw. And then the cam is secured to the end of the shaft with a roll pin. I'm turning this over just so I can install the brake handle. There's a pin that gets driven um, through the handle and the shaft. And then uh, that pin is secured with a set screw. I'm going to install the brake shoes next. When I got the mill, um, these two springs that uh, go between the brake shoes, one of them was broken and lying in the 
gear housing and the other one was was in pretty poor shape so they definitely needed to be replaced the shoes on the other hand were in good shape so i kept them One side of this brake shoe assembly goes around those brake fingers and the others uh, sit around this uh, pivot sleeve that is then uh, bolted to the brake housing. And turning my attention back to the bull gear and the bull gear pinion, uh, I'm putting the timing pulley on top of that pinion shaft. <clears throat> to make assembly of the next part a little bit easier, I'm putting the spindle pulley hub upside down on top of the spindle. And then I can put the belt housing base with the um, brake assembly on top of it and then secure it with uh, the bolts into that brake bearing cap. And I'm turning this over right side up, I can slide it onto the spindle and then um, fish the timing belt around the spindle pulley hub and the timing belt pulley. And then I'm using some socket head cap screws to bolt the belt housing base to the gear housing. Again, I am just making these snug. I am not tightening them down just yet. So I've got the uh, variable speed belt in place there while I try to get the sliding pulley on to the top of this uh, of the spindle pulley hub um, it's a bit of a snug fit at the top I there must have been a burr up there that I I missed uh, but once I got it past the top of it it slid right on and then there's a snap ring that goes into that large groove uh, at the top of the spindle pulley hub And with that together, next I will put on the belt housing. Now you might remember early on in this video, I installed that speed change plate that's attached to the chain into the upper inside of this belt housing. Um, terrible camera angle here, but what I'm doing is I am uh, inserting some screws that go through that sliding plate and into the uh, bearing cap on the top of that uh, upper pulley. And now I can um, use these very long socket head cap screws to secure that belt housing down. Again, I'm just making them snug. I'm not tightening them up completely just yet. And now turning my attention over to the motor, I'm installing the adjustable motor Veridisc assembly. This was a new assembly. The original was damaged beyond use. And then the retaining ring that goes on the end of the shaft. The two bolts that are in the top of that plate are there to hold that spring compressed to make installation of uh, this, of the motor. Uh, possible. And before I install the motor, I'm going to go ahead and install this top bearing uh, and the bearing cap. Uh, this top bearing was missing. Um, so this is a this is the other new bearing that was used here. There are uh, three socket head cap screws that to hold the bearing cap onto this belt housing. And the, the bearing to the spindle pulley hub is a tight fit, so I want to 
slowly um, tighten these screws down uh, a little bit at a time and going all the way around to ensure that it goes on uh, even and straight. And before I forget, I'm putting these two socket head cap screws to secure the bottom half of the variable speed dial. And now we get to the fun part of lifting up a heavy motor and trying to insert it into this housing and around a belt um, all while standing on top of my workbench. So I'm inserting the motor sort of at an angle so that I can get some room to reach up underneath and grab the variable speed belt and fit it over top of the bottom pulley on the motor shaft. With the belt properly in place, um, I can bolt the motor down to the housing. With the motor secured, I can uh, remove these two um, spring retaining screws from that variable disc pulley. Um, these keep that spring in compression, and, and now I don't want it that way. So I slowly go back and forth between the two screws uh, to remove them until they're out completely. These screws will then be used to um, install the uh, lower uh, pulley cover. The high range, low range switch, which is essentially a forward and reverse switch, is mounted to the side of the belt housing. But before I can mount it, I need to remove the cover. And I found a couple of socket head cap screws that were the right diameter and thread pitch. Uh, to go ahead and mount it. Well, let's fire it up. Well, that's not good. The motor seems to be bogging down. I know the motor's good because I saw it run at the uh, ma machinery rebuilder that fixed the motor shaft for me. It, it turns on, but there's something wrong. I don't. I. I don't think that thing's putting out enough power. This is in neutral right now. And then it dies. I think it's that phase converter thing. That static phase converter can't seem to fire this thing up. I know the motor's fine because I saw it run it. These machinery. It gets going. But then it, it doesn't have enough juice. It doesn't have enough juice to keep going. Some of you watching this may already know what's happening and what I later end up discovering was the root cause of this. Since a static phase converter is essentially just a start capacitor on the third leg of a three phase motor, that um, third leg doesn't stay energized for very long. So when I'm trying to start this with the uh, RPM set at near maximum, that's a maximum load on the motor. I guess so. 
So essentially what's happening is that the motor doesn't get up to a speed in which just two of the three legs are capable of keeping it running. I need to, start, I need to tighten things up because things are still loose right now. And now with the machine running and sort of settling in place, I can go ahead and tighten up all the screws and nuts. With um, everything now nice and tight, it's running a lot smoother. Um, I just n need to make sure that before I turn it off, I lower the RPM, or at least I need to change it rapidly the first time I start it. I want to do some powered test of the power down feed and the clutch. Everything seems to be functioning the way that I would expect that uh, easy fix of the uh, overload clutch uh, seemed to do the trick. And the down feed speed selector is operating perfectly. And so is the manual uh, fine feed wheel working uh, just as I would want. Well, so far, so good. Getting close to the end. Thanks for watching.